uh, you are a medieval historian. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's get started. This is like one of my favorite uh, periods in history. So let's That's go right. through your background uh, quickly on this subject. Yeah, so um, I got kind of like seduced into it all uh, because I, I did my undergrad at uh, Loyola University of Chicago, shout out, uh, which just happened to have a really good medieval department. And I always knew I was going to uh, be a history major of some description, um, but I hadn't really had a huge opportunity to learn about medieval history like I think most of us uh, do. You know, I was, kind of, you know, I was aware, you know, I knew about the Hundred Years' War. I was aware of the Black Death. I knew such things existed you know but I never got a chance in high school to kind of go in depth of it so because I was a big nerd and I did a bunch of AP things I tested out of like all the requirements so my first semester it's it was like well what do you want to do and I was like oh I'll take this one about a you know medieval French society fell absolutely head over heels in love and it was it was just over it was over immediately so um <laughs> so I went from there and then I I came and moved over to the UK where I'm still now um I did my master's and PhD at University College London um, and, uh, I, because, they, you know, we kind of keep the medieval history over here. There's a lot of wonderful medievalists in the States. I'm not saying that it, that there are not, but it's just much easier in terms of doing research and stuff because the sources are right here. Um, and I'm lucky and I can stay here. So blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, I just, I absolutely fell for it. And, um, I never figured out a way to stop doing it as a result. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. So uh, let's get started with what even like the word medieval means. Oh, and this is such a good point because I think a lot of people don't realize this. And a lot of the time, unfortunately, the way people tend to relate to the word medieval is they think it's just a pejorative, right? Where they're like, oh, medieval, that means bad. Or uh, medieval, sometimes people will think that that anything of that is like pre-Victorian is medieval. That's not the case. Um, so medieval, uh, as the name kind of tells us, uh, or, you know, the term Middle Ages tells us, it's the middle time. And so what do we mean by that? Uh, well, we mean it starts after the end of the ancient period, the ancient period being the great majority of human history, but, you know, we don't have a lot of records for it. So, you know, whatever. Uh, and so, and we say that it begins after the quote unquote fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476. Um, you know, I'm one of those insufferable historians who's like, what do we mean by fell? I don't know if Rome fell, you know, it's terrible. Um, and then it ends at the modern period. Uh, well, and then the question is, well, when does the modern period start? And this makes the whole thing a lot more hazy uh, because, you know, it, it could mean different things. So some people will say that, oh, well, the modern period kind of begins with the uh, unification of Spain and like the beginning of the Columbian Exchange, so 1492. Great answer. Um, some people will say that it en it ends with the fall of Constantinople because if it begins with the fall of Rome, then ending with the fall of Constantinople in 1453, that that's really neat bookmarks, right? Where you just go, okay, well, is there still some Eastern Roman Empire around? There you go. That makes it medieval. Um, you could say that uh, it starts with uh, Martin Luther rising to prominence in 1517. I would take that. That's fine. Um, and I, but I mean, I think that the thing to take away from this is that there's really different answers uh, to it, depending on what you're studying. So um, I am a Bohemia specialist. And so for me, I kind of feel like the Hussite Wars, when they kick off, that's sort of like the end of medieval things. And and there's no right or wrong answer here, right? Because it's like, well, what is modernity? That's, that's sort of the question here. But uh, run of the mill answer, real easy one. If there's a potato or a tomato and you can see a Protestant you've gone too far and you're in the modern period, right? <laughs> so like that's, so you're, you're in the, you're in the modern period, then it might be the early modern period, but it's still the modern period. So round about, it's about 1100 to 1000 years of history, give or take. Um, and yeah. Yeah. So if you say like 475 to 1500, you're not going to be wrong. It's, it's sketchy. It, and, but you know what, whatever all history is and all of history. Is, all of history. Yeah. It is, it is, <laughs> you know, so that, that's how it works, you know? Yeah. So <clears throat> with you saying uh, those, those two key words, tomato and potato, mm -hmm. um, funny enough, those are actually in a lot of uh, media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So why is it that a potato and a tomato are kind of those two key food mm. items that like we eat every single day that are now like a obvious sign that the medieval period ended? Yeah, so it's because potatoes and tomatoes come from the Americas. 
Um, and they were now there was some American contact uh, in particular with like Asia um, in the medieval period. So kind of like up around, you know, Yakutsk and things like that, you know, there, there is some back and forth trading in, in the period. And we maybe have some evidence that um, as well, like the Chinese occasionally got, uh, for example, luxury goods that would have had their origins on kind of like the Yucatan Peninsula. We have some evidence for that. However, it isn't kind of like massive and sustained trade at any point in time. So these are worlds that simply do not have potatoes and tomatoes because the Americans were just all enjoying those um, off right. on their own. And, and nobody in Afro-Eurasia had these things. So um, it takes some guys coming over on boats and bringing it back in order for that to happen. And now because both tomatoes and potatoes are great, I think we can all agree, um, <laughs> two good foods, fantastic work. Um, they, they took off really, really quickly. They, especially potatoes um, in kind of like Northern soils here in Europe, uh, they take a, a, um, they take on uh, really, really easily. And so they become incredibly widespread very quickly. Uh, but, you know, if you look at medieval recipes, there's na nary a tomato or potato in sight, right? Like things that uh, Italian people are doing with pasta are very, very different in the medieval period. And uh, it's quite funny to me. But um, it, that, that isn't to say that they don't have it, for example, in the early modern period. So like uh, Elizabethans have potatoes. In, in the in the UK, you know, things like that, like around about that that place. Um, and then people just kind of get confused because again, it's like, well, what what is what, you know, like it doesn't medieval just be old, no. Uh, but yeah, so it, potatoes and tomatoes is a good marker of the modern period. All right. That's, that is a good, good <laughs> indicator, yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> trade, trade um. is so interesting, right? I love it. Yeah. No, that is really interesting because it's like these are two everyday items and yet those were something that came specifically from the Americas and mm -hmm. those are kind of the flags for the medieval period to end it. Um, so I'm curious now because whenever the word medieval comes up, mm -hmm. um, what has always come to mind is like knights, dragons, magic, queens, kings, wars, castles, uh -huh, fantasy. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> um, so how much of that actually, well, actually I should start with saying, so that seems like only 20% of the population at the most kind of yeah. favored in that. Yeah. You're, you're not wrong. Right. Because so 80% of the European population are peasants and that's mm -hmm. what it is. Um, and then of that 70%, uh, so like 70% of the entire European population are also serfs, which is to say that they're unfree. So most people are just farming. Like that's, that's the thing that that is happening is that people are farming. Um, but we get these ideas about the medieval period. So, you know, we have this real outsized kind of emphasis on, you know, kings and queens and nobles and things of this nature, because um, the way that source survival works. So in the first place, um, you know, not everybody's literate in the medieval period um, and, in, you know, indeed far from it. And more to the point too, like even when we mean literate in the medieval period, a lot of time we mean people who are like reading and writing in Latin. Um, and it's not kind of until the later medieval period uh, that uh, really writing a lot in the vernacular takes off. Although, although there's always some writing in French for you know, because French is so widely spoken, which is a kind of a boring sign touch up. But <laughs> my point is, you know, there are all these certain groups of people who really know how to read and write. And those are the ones who have leisure time. Right. So if you you can't really be doing your hard work out side all day long and then you're not going to come in and, and start writing a tome right that's not going to happen so that's that's one thing is just like the people that are drawn from the richer parts of society are the ones who can read and write so what do they write about well they write about themselves right so they write about the people that they see um the other thing is just plain old source survival and uh, source survival is a really really interesting thing because we just lose a lot of things over time because they're quite old um, and what I always uh, try to tell people about this is like, you know, whenever you move house and you kind of like, uh, well, we have this less now, I'm gonna have to think of a new analogy, but like, you know, sometimes you'll have like, uh, all of your like electricity bills or something together in one place. And then like, if you move house, you're like, oh, throw all these out. I don't need that. And like moving on. Right. Yeah. Those could be sources. Right. And literally this thing happens. So for example, um, we have in the German lands in the 18th century, a really large consolidation of libraries and monasteries underneath the imperial crown. So whereas monasteries used to have just like these really extensive libraries, uh, the imperial crown is like, no, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take these all under my auspices, like in the name of modernization. And they're kind of like seen it, seen it, 
don't care. <laughs> this is old, you know, and they, and so they end up just throwing a lot of things away, just like burning a lot of things because they just don't care about it. Um, and you just need things to kind of last for a really long time. So what are the things that last for a really long time? Well, there'll be things that are like owned by rich people who are like, this is like substantiates my claims to various things. These are histories that help uh, place me in the best particular position. And here I am in my own library where I'm amassing all these things. And because we are rich people and live in a palace, we can continue to do this. Um, you also just have a big problem with fire over time. Like a lot of things are burned down in a world where there is no electricity. Um, so fire is a really, really big problem. Um, and, you know, indeed to this day, if you join the Bodleian uh, Library in Oxford, when you do, you have to swear an oath that you will not light fires in the library because of like all the source losses there have, or we have terrible source loss here in England um, after Henry VIII uh, takes over the church and uh, seizes all the monasteries. Again, huge like burnings of uh, libraries and books, you know? So you'll have all these, these moments where we just lose stuff, right? So there might have been a lot more along the way, but then people will be like, ah, oh, who really cares about a peasant, right? Cause it's just not the way that, that people think about things. So we have sources that survive that are about rich people because they're written by rich people and then they're held onto by rich people and then other rich people are like, oh yeah, this is important. But if you can't convince people that's important, it's not going to stick. So yeah, rich people basically just have a bigger advantage um, of telling us about what it is they like. So, and, and so that just kind of like stilts our worldview, you know? Okay, so that, is, that explains a lot. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, so now my next question to follow up from that. So serfs and peasants, these are two yes. different groups of people. Um, and I think they're mixed together or blended yes. in kind of yes. like the mainstream sense. So yeah. what is the difference between the two? Great question. Okay. So serfs and peasants, it's like, um, squares and rectangles, right? Like all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are square. Right. Mm -hmm. So all, all serfs are peasants, but not all peasants are serfs. And when one is a serf, one is unfree, is basically the thing. So, uh, and this unfreedom has a number of characteristics. So, for example, you could just be like, I'm bored of living here. I'm going to move to another place. Like, hey, you can't do that. Like, that's not a thing. You would have to petition your lord who owns you um, and say, can I please move? And then he's going to say no, uh, <laughs> you know, because... Uh, you know, like that, that would be a less tax for him. Um, and I mean, to be clear here also, like sometimes your Lord isn't a guy, your Lord could be a monastery uh, just as okay. easily, things like that. So um, the church are really large landholders and they have serfs as well. Okay, um, so the church can own you or the king can yeah, own you. Or the king can own you or the local noble can own you, like all the, you know, whatever. Um, and, you know, there are also things within this, like, for example, if you want to get married, a lot of the time you have to say, I'm getting married. And then sometimes you have to like pay a fee that says like you're married. Um, mm -hmm. But there are certain things that come along with this. So in general, you will have a you you will have a strip of land that is like kind of yours um, that you can pass down through your family and stuff. Uh, these are often kind of arranged into what we call a salion. They're like big, big long strips of land, um, and you will work that, and then you will pay a certain percentage of whatever your crop yield is to your landlord, and then you kind of get to keep the rest and sell the rest and do whatever it is you want to do with it. Um, there is often also sometimes a, what is called a uh, labor tax, which in French is a corvée, which comes up a lot. And then, so every year, a lot of the time, you will have to go like, for example, bring in your Lord's harvest or like help the, with the plowing on your Lord's land. Um, if you become very wealthy as peasant, which is possible, completely possible, you can sometimes get out of that. Like you could pay them off and say like, here, here's money instead. And your landlord will be like, yeah, right. You are <laughs> fine. You don't have to come bring in the harvest, you know, uh, but poorer peasants would have to, would have to help out with that. So poorer serfs. Um, and so basically there are a series of, of rights that you have to kind of give your Lord, but you do still have some kind of some say over what your land is. Um, and also, you know, consider that for the majority of the medieval period, uh, you have kind of like the open field system. So there's kind of like communal grazing usually around in your town. There might be like a fish pond that you're able to use. Uh, you know, the, there might be like copses and woods where you can forage uh, wood from. Uh, but then also sometimes there'll be kind of like a particular dues owed to your Lord. Like for example, if he owns a mill, he could say, well, you, you have to grind all your flour at my mill and you have to pay for the privilege. So it's just kind of all this sort of like constant nickel and diming 
that happens mm-hmm. and a general kind of sense that you can't direct your life um, overall whatsoever. It's in no way um, as uh, onerous, for example, as chattel slavery, um, which often persists in the medieval period, like as a leftover from uh, the modern period, uh, sorry, modern period, the ancient period. So, uh, and, you know, we also see it extensively, for example, like uh, one of the big things Vikings trade in is enslaved people. Uh, so you do have slavery around it, and that's not quite the same thing as being a serf, but being a serf is still not free and you you don't really want to be a serf like just to be clear uh but it sounds, of- yeah it sounds like this giant system of debt that you're yeah that somehow someone is always keeping you at exactly that is exactly the way to think about it yes okay all right sounds like an unpleasant life yeah, it's not, it, I mean, the thing is, like, it's possible to have a nice time within that. And we do see that, like, peasants have, like, a real sense of community and, you know, they kind of, like, big each other up. And, you know, you can have a, you can have a pretty, like, as I say, you could be, you could become wealthy. Like, some, there's been some really interesting work on demographics of uh, peasants in general. And we kind of see that of pe- the peasant population, a lot of the time, sort of 50% of that, so, like, uh, are, like, what we call kind of middle class or rich, like, pretty well off. And then 50%, like, but but to be fair, like fifty percent are pretty poor, you know. Um, so, like, it's not. You, my basic thing is like, let's not go. Like, I I think that we have to be careful of two things. We have to be careful of romanticizing it too much, where people are like, oh, medieval peasants actually had more free time than you, and it's like, kind of technically, but I still don't want to trade places with them. Um, and then on the other hand, some people will be like, oh, well, everyone was dying trod and it was terrible all the time. And it's like, ugh, it's just kind of something in between there, you know, and it really depends who you're talking to, where and when, you know. Okay. So some of the things to what it sounds like is, so they had their work and then they had their free time, mm-hmm. but that free time also came with, well, you have to maintain your own house. Well, mm-hmm. you have to make your own clothes. Well, you have to cook your own food. Well, you have to figure out a way how to store things. Yeah. Winter. For yeah. Winter. Yeah. Yeah. You're bang on because there's there's so much other stuff to do. It's like uh, we're talking about people who make their own thread. You know, like they they make their <laughs> own cloth and then they make their own uh, they make their own clothing out of that. You know, um. So they'll, they'll be out here growing flask flask flax there we go flax in order to uh make linen you know um they're they're carding wool and they're weaving and they're, you know there's there's just so many other things to do and um you know on top of that like you know you might get the day off because it's a holy day there's a lot of that but the cow still has to get milked every day you know you still have to feed the chickens there's still like you know there are still these kind of like ongoing jobs that it doesn't matter what you do they need to be done every single day so there is this certain level of manual labor and as you say you need to cook your own food over a hearth you know you you're baking your own bread you're brewing your own beer you're like you know it's yeah. it's at every single level these are things that you're kind of doing yourself and yes if you're wealthy you can hire people in to help with that so wealthy peasants for example will have like dairy maids to help with the milking or you know you might have a dedicated brewery that you've hired people to work in like you might have servants even when you're a peasant but the point of it is they are a lot less alienated from kind of like every step of the process of making things like that's what they're doing and you'll see this all the time even when you know you have people relaxing by a fire you know in a painting like a woman is sitting there knitting or like sewing right okay Maybe that could be like a future video. Garrett goes to England and yeah. <laughs> experiences the torture of everyday medieval life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's all fun and games till you're growing your own flax. You know, yeah. Like it's, uh, oof, yeah. Very difficult plant to maintain. And from what I hear, it is a nightmare to make thread out of it. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, like, granted, we all agree that linen is a great material and we've kind of kept using it, but oof, it's a nightmare. And like, I, I really happily let other people deal with that for me, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> I've got, yeah, my, my, uh, I, I have a winter blazer that's made out of wool and I Ooh. love wearing it because yeah, yeah, it's something that can keep me warm when it's mm-hmm. like 10 degrees outside. I can just be wearing that with my hands in my pockets. Yeah, I mean, I love that I'm constantly talking about this, but wool is such an important commodity for medieval mm-hmm. Europe. It, it's sort of like the uh, commodity for medieval Europe is wool because it's amazing, right? Yeah. And anyone who owns a wool blazer, like I've got a wool blazer that I absolutely love and I swear by. And like, I sometimes worry about how much I wear it in the winter. I'm like, probably I should be wearing something else. But um, it really, <laughs> it, it really, really works. It really keeps you warm. It breathes well. So you never feel gross and sweaty like you do with synthetic materials now. And also, you know, it's a miracle. It stays warm even when it's wet. 
wet so you can get soaking wet and you're fine really because it still retains heat you know and what we can't really say that about you know man-made materials so it's brilliant yeah but I'm pretty sure like the the whole process of making that too. Also I know, I know, <laughs> no, like, I mean, even when I have friends who like love knitting and things, it's like, you know, no, they're not out here spinning. Let's be real. <laughs> like, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so like a quick step, well, kind of still in the relation of peasants. Um, I am curious about the whole like sword in the stone. Yeah. Arthurian legends, um, can, could a peasant, or even will, I'm willing to ask a serf, would be, would, have there ever been a possibility in the medieval times that someone at that level could have the potential of becoming a knight or having a place in nobility? Yeah, it's a really, really tough one. And as a general rule of thumb, the answer is no. Um, but especially like now, if you were a quite well-to-do peasant, you might be able to buy your way into it. So if you are very, very wealthy um, and you like grease enough palms, yes, it's possible. And, and indeed, one of the things that can happen here is we know that, for example, the, the gentry, which are kind of like a class of very, very well-to-do peasants, um, they will sometimes even have like, uh, you know, small private armies, things like that, you know, and um, say something happens like a war gets called and you have a bunch of like, you know, pikemen or something and you say to the king or the local lord hey happy to like send these pikemen out then they might say oh okay well fantastic like yeah, yeah like let's let you in but it takes things like that and usually money is kind of the answer it's like money or local power are the things that are involved here um it would be kind of possible also in, in a really indirect way, like say you're a serf and you can run away from your your the land that you're tied to. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, if you can make it to a city and you can survive in the city for a year and a day without your landlord finding out you're there, then you're free. And then say you apprentice yourself into a guild and then you become a guild member and you make a lot of money. Then, you know, maybe you can start lending money to the king. And then maybe after that, you know, the king will be like, oh, well, this person lends me a lot of money. I like that. Then, you know, and, and you can kind of like be brought up that way. But passingly rare. Um, so it's not impossible, but it's extraordinarily unlikely. And, you know, fundamentally, this is not a system that seeks to, you know, tend towards egalitarianism. You know, the, the medieval world is one wherein society is really considered as ordered in a particular way for a particular reason. Um, and they are pretty big on keeping the poor poor. <laughs> you know, they're, they're sort of like, oh, you, you kind of stay down there and, and, and that's kind of fine. Um, there can be machinations uh, within the nobility themselves because you could be like lesser nobility be kind of like nothing but climb your way up if you make smart decisions, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you, you know, there are kind of ways of ingratiating oneself, but, you know, the best way of doing it is always going to be to be wealthy. Um, although, you know, you can begin gifts or good jobs or things like that if you, you know, do a good turn for the royalty, like somehow, but, you know, like this whole thing, like, the, the, like actual damsels in distress isn't really so much of a thing, right? So, you know, it, it, like there are passing few opportunities to really kind of impress anybody that way. All right. So it just sounds like if things like that happened, it was an exceptional case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, I do have to ask probably the most popular question is, did they enjoy bathing and where did they <laughs> bathe? Yeah. yeah. The answer. Yes. Uh, they, they, they love to bathe is a, you know, like a quick answer. Um, and there's a couple of answers to this. So if you live in a city or in a village, um, often sometimes as well, if you've got larger uh, villages, there will be uh, bath houses where that's all anybody ever does is like kind of catch, fetch and carry clean water, heat it up, things like that. Because, you know, let's keep in mind, this is a world without plumbing. Water is really heavy. Uh, it's a really kind of like manual job. And so when you got to heat it up and then put it in another thing and then da da da, da and then carry it out when it gets cold, that's a whole, that's a whole nine yards, right? So this is a profession. Um, and indeed uh, at certain points it becomes, there are like guilds of, of bathhouse or owners. So like Paris has guilds for this, for example. Uh, but you see bathhouses in all major cities and they, they do a couple of things. Like one, it's like, yeah, you can get clean, but also it's, it's seen as a form of relaxation. You know, it's like going to the spa now, you know, in the same way that we enjoy 
enjoy it. Um, but you will also probably have your own tub at home and, you know, probably once a week you will have a big bath, but they bathe more often outdoors in the summer. So if it's warm enough, like, you know, you'll pop down to the river or to, you know, wherever people go swimming and, and you'll have a bit of a jump in the sea if it's that sort of thing. Um, and then on a day to day basis, they kind of like, it's like sort of the equivalent of showering, you know, they'll get like a ewer of water and a basin and they'll kind of like wash themselves all up, you know, soap them all up, uh, soap yourself all together. Um, and indeed, soap, you know, this is one of these good medieval inventions, right? Like soap in was the, a medieval invention? Yeah, yeah. So it comes about in the medieval period. Uh, ancient people, interestingly, in Europe, uh, they used olive oil to clean themselves and something called a strigil. Um, and you'll see this all the time if you read like the Odyssey and stuff like that. They, they kind of get in water, then put olive oil on themselves and then scrape themselves down, which mm -hmm. removes dirt uh it, like i mean it works it absolutely works yeah. but uh but the like like coming up with soap that is like you know a, a big medieval thing and so uh you know kind of if, if your argument is like soap medieval people are cleaner right uh but uh yeah so there there is rather a lot of bathing that goes on um the myth interestingly enough comes i think from the modern period because there is this point in time kind of in the late 17th and early 18th century so again modern this is modern uh, where people stop bathing as much um part of this is that what they start doing instead is changing their clothes all the time okay so they will just like change clothes constantly uh, and it so like having you know when you see all kind of like the lacy uh, collars on things and like lace that comes out of the sleeves it's a way of marking that one is clean because that stuff gets changed constantly so if you're covered in sort of like bright white lace then that means that like oh you've probably changed that twice since this morning right and uh there are certain historians who've done uh tests on this and apparently if you just do like change clothes like all the time it does kind of keep you fairly clean because they will just sort of like absorb the oil and gross stuff from your body. And then you kind of change again, change again. Um, and you'll probably smell better than if you bathe and constantly wear filthy clothes uh, then, but you know, odds are like whatever, but, but this is a modern thing, right? So there's, there's, there's a whole thing about how like uh, Louis the 14th didn't bathe. He just changed clothes all the time. So yeah. Yeah. A little disgusting to think yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But uh, but that was modern people, you know, it wasn't medieval people. That wasn't a medieval thing, no. <laughs> okay, all right. That is uh, that is quite the visual. <laughs> quite the visual. Um, so aside from uh, cleanliness, um, mm -hmm. I am curious about superstitions at this mm -hmm. time as well. Were people highly superstitious too? Uh, I mean, I would say yes, probably. You know, and they they they're they are highly religious. You know, that's part of it. Um, and also, so thinking about like superstition and thinking about things like luck and magic. You know, the medieval conception of these is quite different to our own. Now, I mean, they, they live they kind of live in a world where they very much do see that like magic is probably real, right? And th th this is something that they really kind of believe in. Um, but part of this is also that the way that they think about magic really differs because there's a lot of different kinds of magic. So there's what they would so call sort of like natural magic. And, you know, uh, then there are other forms of magic, like, you know, like demonic magic, right? Which is when you summon a demon to do something, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like natural magic, a lot of the time, what it shakes down to is like, there's an observable phenomena that's really cool and they can't explain it, right? So they're like magnets, those are magic, right? Like, whoa, <laughs> like oh, here it is, attractive metal. That's crazy, right? That's magic because they can't explain it. Uh, electric eels are magic. Um, when you have a plant that obviously has medicinal powers, it's generally considered that that is magic. Um, so, you know, like the fact that you can boil willow bark and, you know, it takes away pain, that's magic. Uh, you know, wow, if you take poppies and cook them down, it kills pain, that's magic, you know, and it's... And that is often seen to be uh, natural things have, as having been imbued with powers as a result of God's desire and design. Uh, so it's a form of magic to them. And we would just go, oh, mate, like that's just opium, you know, and they're like, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but, you know, they don't they don't have a way of kind of understanding how that works. So that's fine. So within that, of course, there are other superstitions, you know, about stuff like ghosts. You will see like, you know, some worries about uh, demons certainly does come up. 
um, you know, uh, worries about people using magic for uh, malign purposes. These are all like completely within the cards um, of things that medieval people would believe in. Um, and like, it's probably more widespread, but I suppose the thing that I always say is like, oh, there's still a lot of people who believe exactly those same things, right? So, yeah. Okay, because there are some things that from what I've been able to try to do for research that looks mm -hmm. uh, like acceptable forms of magic, like things people would mm -hmm. leave around their house to keep evil out uh, yes. or disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, uh, it, that's interesting too, because the way that we kind of look at these things um, oftentimes is that like, uh, sometimes things are kind of like, uh, uh, talismanic magic, for example, but it'll be kind of Christian in nature. So uh, there's a really interesting, um, the Welcome Collection has this really great uh, charm that I'm very interested in that was used for women giving birth. And it says like the Hail Mary on it multiple times. So it's a really thin strip of parchment, kind of like a, a measuring tape almost. And it says the Hail Mary over and over and over. And you're supposed to wrap that around women while they were giving birth as kind of like a form of protection for them. And, you know, that's that's a charm right? Okay. It's a charm, but it's acceptable because it's got Christian things on it. So there's also also all these like really interesting kind of liminal areas where you'll be like, are you doing magic or is this kind of religious? And whether or not they knew is the question. So, you know, you'll see particular thing, things like a charms that are meant to tell you like what the outcome of a duel will be. And will we like find these like in the corner of manuscripts or be like, oh, am I gonna die? Well, do this little charm in the, in the, the corner of a manuscript. And, and it'll tell you like, you know, you put up the letters of your name and then like the hour that the, you know, sun is in and you know, you, and you come up with a thing and it's like, yes or no, right? Um, and, these things all kind of like inhabit this world where it's sort of like neither one thing nor another. But it also kind of makes sense if you consider that for them, you know, they live in a really ordered universe. So like within the Christian cosmology, everything kind of exists for a reason. God has these things for a reason and God is sort of overseeing a universe that has been made in a particular way for a particular reason. So in many ways, magic or what we would kind of see as, you know, like charms or talismans, things like this, that they're just a way of ordering that universe, right? You know, it, it's just kind of a practical way of working at kind of using these forces or getting these forces to do a particular thing. Okay. Now there's another question that comes to mind um, in relation with the Knights Templar. Ah, yeah. Okay, so when they were arrested from mm -hmm. the best of my research was that they had statues of uh, pagan deities involved with their practice. Was this actually true? Yeah, it's probably not true at all whatsoever. Um, that's kind of the cover story. Um, and then there's also like a big one. So this gets thrown around at them and it also gets thrown at uh, the good men and women of Languedoc or the Cathars, which there's also a story that they are worship worshiping the devil in the form of a giant black cat that they uh, call down and they kiss its butthole. Uh, this is like... <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Uh, like, is that where so the, the term ass kisser comes from? <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, right, right. Uh, so they, they do, they, there are all these things which are saying, oh yeah, well, they're doing something pagan and that's why they have to be stopped. They were not doing anything pagan. Uh, they just got uh, a little big for their britches. They were incredibly rich. Um, they're incredibly rich because essentially what the order was offering you know, what they had, um, what they had to, to say for themselves was sort of like, well, um, if you ever decide you want to go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, we are the bodyguards that help you along the way, right? And for most Christians at this time, the idea that one would go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem, like that's their kind of like cherished, you know, desire at a point in time. So if they have a little bit of extra money, they kick money to the Knights Templar because, you know, it, it's almost aspirational. It's like someday I'm going to be the one that's going to Jerusalem and then the Knights Templar are going to be helping me out. So they've got an absolute ton of money and influence uh, because people just sort of like them. And the King of France basically was just like, well, I'll be having that. <laughs> and uh, and then so the King of France starts it and the church doesn't stop it because they're also like, well, there, there does seem to be rather a lot of money and land up for grabs now, you know, so it, it, it's kind of like inter nissan fighting. But interestingly, it, it, it's like the crown of France that, that kicks it all off. Um, and it, it just, it's kind of like a money and power grab.
Uh, but they had to come up with a reason for why they were doing it. And then the reason is paganism? Question, yeah. you know, like a question mark. Uh, so it, that's quite a funny one. Uh, but yeah, they, it, it's just, basically it was the King of France wanted some money. And uh, it worked out really well for him, that, that, that particular move. All right. <laughs> and managed to get away with it. Yeah, I know he really did. I mean, well, who's going to stop you? It's really easy to get away with things if you're the king of France, it turns out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he also he also issued the Malleus Maleficarum, so. Yeah, the Malleus Maleficarum is so funny too. I'm obsessed with it because um, it's so funny because it was made and um, no one at the time believed it. In the Middle Ages, everyone was like, all right, Heinrich, uh, seems to me like you got clowned on by that lady that you're obsessed with and you took her to court and lost your battle case, like, <laughs> your, your legal case against her. And it just seems like you are psychosexually obsessed with women. Like this is this is absolute wildness, right? And 150 years later, people are like, this is real. <laughs> you know, because because it, like, uh, it, 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 like, it takes on like over time, it takes on like the, oh, well, this was definitely real. Whereas medieval people were like, homie, no. Like, oh, I, I love it, I love it, I love it. So. Oh, that's great. That's <laughs> great in all of the wrong ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because I have yeah I have this joke because uh, I bought a copy of it um mm. and the copy that I have is this pink book with some of the drawings from the time that mm -hmm. I would imagine people depicted was like signs of devil worship like people riding yeah. donkey backwards um yes <laughs> <laughs> all this other weird art stuff and the opening of it the book and the translation at the like this is like the first page the very bottom of it just says the church gets to decide what is right and what is good um mm. <laughs> and you're like i mean i guess which is quite funny right because um part of what is what happens in order to kind of like lend it credence um is that he was making that argument to the church right? So he was saying to the church, you get to decide what's right and what's good. Um, and this is what's right and good is to go after witches. And again, at the time, the church was like, I'm, I think we're fine, you know, but then later, they was sort of like picked up on like, yes, this, this is correct. And then interestingly, it gets used by both Catholics and Protestants during uh, the, the witch panics. Um, and uh, like, so basically some Protestants will be like, oh, well, the church has kind of like lost its authority here because they didn't do a good enough job cracking down on witches. And then Catholics will be like, no, we're the only ones vested with the authority to crack down on witches. And it's because like uh, Catholics and Protestants are kind of like in their like engaged in like a Christian off. They're like, <laughs> they're, they're like, who's the most Christian? No, you're not, we are. And so they, they both start like buying into the Malleus, which is, it's ridiculous, that, um, that, which, which at the time like is like, mm -hmm. and like, we think they lied too. Like, we think that it's kind of a lie at the beginning of the book. They're like, oh yeah, the Pope said definitely write this because he thought that we were cool. And it's like, the Pope did not ask for this. Like, <laughs> you know, so. It's quite funny. But then later everyone was like, wow, the Pope was asking for it. It's, it's, it's just crazy how it works, you know, but yeah. God. Yeah. That, that is crazy. I, I, I love it, but it's like terrifying at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. I mean, that kind of reminds me of like when I used to be a student in Boston and I'd watch mm -hmm. like protest groups try to like protest off with each other. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That, that's a hundred percent what's kind of like happening there. Yeah, that, like you know, it's kind of like a war of it's it's uh, it's like the Cold War, but with spirituality. All right. Yeah. <laughs> the first Cold War. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I am curious too because this is where, for the first time, at least public, we start to get to see like when the Knights Templar were arrested. That mm -hmm. was where the symbol of Baphomet associated with. Oh Superman, yeah, 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 yeah. Which has mm -hmm. always been a pagan god of duality. Yeah. And now suddenly, like the Knights Templar get arrested, here's the symbol that pops up, and now suddenly it becomes the Lord of Beasts. What mm -hmm. was? Was there some like? Did is there anything on that? Well, it's an interesting one because we think that uh, like these things have kind of like always been around um, and especially in what we kind of call uh, like the the dualist forms of Christianity. So, for example, like your Waldensians, um, you know, things of that nature uh, where they, there is kind of like a belief 
among some groups that like the physical world in general is like bad and uh the the good world is kind of like the spiritual world right um in terms of baphomet or baphomet um the first time we see it ever written down is actually medieval so in 1098 um and it is um in a letter about the siege of antioch uh by a crusader um and they they found the holy hand grenade yeah yeah and they're like the, he claims so there's this crusader claimed that the people who lived in Antioch were calling on Baphomet for help and uh and it's so it's interesting so it's really really similar to what happens to the Knights Templar right because they're kind of like mm, not Christian Baphomet you know they're like a question mark so that so the devil and you see this really commonly um when people are called upon to uh describe non-christian religions and they just kind of like don't know what to do so they're just like Baphomet, like a real like really really quickly and you'll, you'll see it for example um even later like in russian depictions or when they're kind of like uh taking the steps for example um and they will they come uh, like up against like mongolians and their little pictures of them because they're trying to indicate that they're they're not christian and like some of them are muslim some of them are buddhist and they'll like show them with little like um roman idols and stuff to be like haha see they're pagans right because they they, <laughs> they don't know so the, like the, it's it's an interesting one because it's where the Christian mind goes in order to um, in order to say something about their enemies, right? So it's something that purely exists in the Christian imagination. But you know, here you know when this crusader is saying, "Oh yeah, like the siege of Antioch," it goes this particularized way. It's like he's accusing Muslims of like praying to to like Baphomet, and it's like, no man, like th- that like that that a hundred percent did not happen, right? Um, so like there is this thing then that people say that it kind of like gets associated, uh, with the, the Knights Templar. And that's, that is one of the things they definitely get like called up on. Um, and it's like, this is kind of like a thing that, that, that goes back and forth. So some, uh, historians, um, in particularly like Michael Hag, uh, thinks that maybe that it, there was kind of like a jokey, in Templar initiation, right? Mm-hmm. That involved like spitting on the cross, which is things that they did. I, I, I find it hard to believe uh, mm-hmm. just because at the very least it would be really stupid uh, to, to, to do that, right? Because it's like when you're a huge organization like this, it's, it's likely that you're going to, um, you are going to get like called on it. Um, but, you know, like the the idea of there being an idol of Baphomet, it, it's kind of like comes about from the Inquisition of the Templars in general. So we don't have like idols of it until around that point in time. Um, and then it becomes much more popular um, again, kind of like in the 19th century and things like that, when you, when you have kind of like, uh, you know, the, the crisis for spiritualism and things like that again. But it, it's always kind of like around um at, at like it, it kind of like pops up uh but it usually gets kind of like um it kind of gets like thrown around in general at any set of enemies that christians don't like and it whilst at the same time like being a really christian thing to think exists you know it, it's like that okay that's a it's <laughs> a very interesting history yeah it, it is it really like is. a separate yeah. separate video called the history of baffy I know. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. That would be, that'd be a lot of fun. I think I know, I think I know somebody who's got, who's got a similar costume to wear too. So, so we could have <laughs> like a live, <laughs> could have like a live theater performance while oh, yeah. Eleanor giving, <laughs> giving a voiceover. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'll do a voiceover and be like, well, this is what they said that the Knights Templar were doing. Eh, who knows, yeah. you know? Yeah. All right. So it'll be like drunk history, just, just yeah. to leave it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So um, Christian. So there's a couple of other Christian related questions I have. Oh, one go for it. Has to do with chivalry and another one has to do with uh, the temple, the cross of the Templars. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's one picture in particular. Um, for me, I've had a little bit of confusion finding or trying to understand the symbolism. So before it was just kind of like this perfectly equal cross. 
that you now kind of see used with Harley riders nowadays. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that's drawn all over a wall in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. suddenly we kind of switch over to what uh, was on the Knights Templar cross to the Hospitaller cross, where it was this elongated cross. Yeah. So I'm I'm curious, like, was was there a shift in the symbology, or were they both used? Uh, so they're both used, um, and it, it's just that we think so. The to be a, for us, like a Templar cross is probably the really even one. Um, and you know, the, the big symbology here is meant to be like the redness is they're saying that, you know, they're willing to die. So it's sort of like supposed to kind of like symbolize blood. So the really, really even one, that is the one that I would call a Templar cross. And that's what kind of springs to mind. The elongated one is more likely to be identified with the hospitalers who, as you say, who are related, but not the same. Um, and the hospitalers kind of like, as the name indicates. So if you think about the Templars as bodyguards, the hospitalers are kind of like, uh, they have like, you know, a series of interconnected kind of like, yeah, hospitals. But hospitals at the time aren't necessarily just medical. Like hospitals are often also, it's just kind of like a word for an inn as okay. well. So it's like, it's, so it's like a place that you would go get hospitality. Um, and so y- it helps you kind of know who you're you're getting help from and who it is you're going to and it helps them kind of drum up money for different funds because again the the hospitalers are also quite a popular order i'm not so much so as the templars because the templars are seen as a bit more like you know fighty so they have that they have that going for them and people quite like that the kind of like romance of it but uh hospitalers like the longer one as a general rule of thumb you should associate with the hospitalers Uh, but so both can be uh uh in use at the same time uh, but it, it probably is indicative of whatever organization it is you're talking about there. All right. All right. And um, so speaking on the topic of knights, um, mm-hmm. I'm curious about chivalry at this time. Ah, yeah. Chivalry, this is a funny one, right? Because so chivalry, the thing to think about with chivalry, it, is, it isn't it is wh- how people use it now. The way that people talk about it now is largely a Victorian invention um, and the idea that it's all about like, you know, holding a door open for a woman or, you know, whatever, like that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, you know, chivalry is as a general rule of thumb, a form of guidance for how you should behave towards other members of the knightly class, um, which is why, hence the term chivalry, because it comes from like the cheval or chevalier. So like, you know, this is, this is a code of conduct for guys on horses towards other guys on horses and pretty much emphatically only towards other guys on horses. Um, if you're not a guy on a horse, it doesn't count for you like that. It, it simply doesn't matter. Um, an interesting thing about chivalry is there's no such thing as a code of chivalry as well either. Like it never gets written down. It's just sort of like, these are generalized kind of like rules for how one should act towards the other rich guys, right? And when we do see kind of things written about like, well, what is chivalric and like what one should kind of like assume that one does in these cases, it's usually kind of like about warfare. It's about like, you know, the rules in battle and what's going to happen and how the, these things should happen. Um, and that makes perfect sense because uh, warfare is so incredibly different. Okay. Um, so uh, because really for while you still have a knightly class, warfare really is a lot more uh, focused on kidnapping other members of the knightly class and then ransoming them, right? So you have all these like these codes of conduct and for what is chivalrous because it's like, but we're not gonna kill each other, right guys? Like, no, no, we're not, no, we're not, no one's killing anybody. We're gonna kidnap you. We're gonna ransom you. We're gonna make a lot of money. And like, this is a big way that people kind of like make money back and forth. So they, it'll also kind of like extend to rules for like who charges first in battles. So like, still, you know, the way that we think about it now is like, oh, like put some arrows down and then send out your pikemen and then send out your cavalry. Often for them, they send out the cavalry first because the rich guys all want to go like kidnap each other. And then you can kind of send the foot soldiers in afterwards. So largely chivalry is just a way of talking about martial things to the other people who are engaged in it at the same level. So it does not extend to women. It does not extend to like peasants. It's just kind of like, what do you owe to other knights? Okay. Uh, and the answer is uh, quite a lot, uh, apparently, you know, cause everybody's trying to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So more of a bro code. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a hundred percent a bro code, yeah. Okay. 
I thought it was a way to try and keep like drunken nights in line because everybody's yeah. been just drunk. You're, well, you're right. You're right. It's a way of like keeping drunk because like they're going around on like these horses, which are like essentially like a weapon, right? They they they're allowed to carry weapons with, when other people aren't. Like I mean, peasants can carry weapons on the road, stuff like that, but you know, not in towns. So there are, and you know, like if you got like some drunk guy like charging around like on a tank you know, that's bad for everybody, right? Like that's bad. So you've got to have some rules about how that's not on, right? So yeah, that's that's what's up. Okay. I thought there was also like a re- religious connection too with that. There's a religious connection to everything, homie. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, you're, you're kind of doing this all in the name of Christianity in theory, right? Like, yeah. so, and that, that's why, and that's part of it. You know, that's why there's limitations on things. Uh, so, you know, because God would hate it if you were doing whatever, but then there's also limits to that. So for example, like God hates it when you have a tournament, according to the church, because people die in tournaments all the time. And the church is like, seems like kind of a waste of life. If you're going around dying in tournaments and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, buddy. So like, you know, all bets are off then. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so is this also like, I'm curious about, was this a time too, because everything we're seeing starting to become Christianized, I was curious if this mm. was a time too, where um, people were still holding on to some pagan, like their pagan it's roots. It, and well, this, this is a really interesting one, right? Because, um, you know, especially in the early medieval period, yeah, <laughs> you know, like in the early medieval period, you know, it takes a while for Europe to Christianize, you know, like when you get into kind of like, christianizing the vikings or christianizing you know latvia and things like that it's, it's actually quite some time in you know even the, you know the czechs we didn't christianize until kind of like right about the ninth century 10th century so you know there, there's quite some time when people are still just like chilling uh and uh, you see this uh, i guess that my favorite example of this um is uh the legend of saint guinefor have you heard this I have not heard the legend of St. Greedford, so okay, I'm okay, so get, story time. get ready, get ready for this one. So the, the St. Greenford is this great, uh, great legend. Uh, uh, and basically you've got kind of like, a, this is in the 13th century. So fairly late on, fairly late on, right? Um, where you have um, a Dominican monk, uh, Stephen of Bourbon. Um, and he is kind of like uh, going around like uh asking uh like hey hey anybody like like a, you know like a going around in an itinerant fashion uh to towns like a kind of seeing what's up in local places and writing down like you know who, who people's local saints are because you know like local cults of saints that's the, where we get most of them things like that and the local peasants of one group are like oh yeah like let us take you to this fantastic shrine that we've got to our local saint saint queen for and he's like oh yeah tell me more and it's like a well and they're like well St. Greenfort was a very good dog. And uh, the story is that uh, there was a knight who owned St. Greenfort, who was a greyhound, and um, a a snake got into the house and was like going after this knight's baby. St. Greenfort attacked the snake, um, and there was like a big tumble and ruckus, and like he knocked over the, the child's uh, the cradle in the meantime. The knight rushes downstairs, sees blood all over the place from the snake and the dog fighting, and goes, the dog has killed my child, and then chops the dog's head off. But then they see the giant snake, and then they realize that St. Greenfort was just a very good boy, um, and everyone is sad. So they put him in a well and bury him in a well, and then it becomes his little grave. And then everyone decides that this dog is a saint. Um, and the church is like, this dog is not a saint uh no you can't have dog saints that's absolutely not it and they're saying there was kind of like a local custom uh that like you know people would like if a baby was sick or something they'd go out and put it by the well uh, and then like the spirit of saint Greenfort would like bless them and they were like well you're worshiping demons now that's what's happening and then the church like put a stop to it and it's like you can't do that so the point is that like local <laughs> devotion uh, is a really, really different kettle of fish to what the church actually ascribes. And I think this is a really important story as well, because it shows, you know, a lot of people, one of the, you know, the myths about the medieval period is that you have a church that's like meddling in every facet of every single person's lives. And that's just not the case. If you go out to the countryside, a lot of the places, it's just, I don't know. Like there's a lot of things going on, right? Like, and, and so local peasants will kind of keep traditions up in particular ways. Um, and that's kind of 
just like one of the things so and these people probably see themselves as being christian but you know they're doing it in the wrong way because you know the mechanism of the church isn't really available to their daily lives there um and but we also have to be careful about like ascribing paganism to certain things because there's like do, do you know what a sheila in the gig is no i don't this okay is, all right. I've, I've heard that name but i've not okay. All right, so a shield and a gig is the thing that you find often on churches, like often carved into uh, the wood of them or there'll be stone things. And it's kind of like, it looks like it's sort of like a bald old woman and she's holding her vulva open, just like big old, just genitals. All right, just yeah. gen genital time, okay? We're not really sure necessarily what they're supposed to be represent. It could be like scaring off the devil with a, a vulva, which is like a thing, like a superstition at the time. It could be a, like a fertility thing. It could be any number of things. And sometimes people look at that and they go, oh, it's pagan. But it's not pagan because it doesn't start existing um, until kind of like around the 12th century or so, 11th century or so. So like it has absolutely no connection at all whatsoever to some form of ancient religion and like holdovers from that. But it's maybe more interesting that people still have these folk ideas or folk knowledges that are like, like kind of come out, out, out of the woodwork. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about like uh, it per, like it per continuing to come about in society as a result of an old religious practice. New things can kind of come up and that doesn't mean that the church signed off on them or that they're particularly Christian, but these people probably think they're Christian and they're doing things that like the Pope probably isn't gonna like, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so, so this is pretty interesting because people were doing something at a certain time and other, like the rest of the world had no clue what it was. Yeah, it was yeah. But I mean, I think that's one of the things I really like about the medieval period is I like how the world's much bigger. And like, you know, even if you're just kind of like out in the wrong bit of the countryside, you're, you're living a really different life to the, what the people in town are doing. Um, and so... You know, you don't have these same kind of like really well-developed mechanisms for kind of looking in on people uh, that that you do now. So you have a lot more differences in terms of culture as a result of it. Okay. All right. So speaking of culture, we are now going to play. Please describe this picture for me. <laughs> okay. All right, girl. All right. So here we are. Yeah. All right. You can see. Mm hmm all right so uh here here it is this is to me uh this is the best of my research prior to this was one of the labors of the year yes that's right yeah absolutely so uh you're seeing a january february march april may and june here as it says up the top um and so it is it's interesting because in January, you're actually kind of like seeing an old form of like what we would kind of see as like uh, depictions of Jupiter. Uh, so he's got like two two heads and things like that. Ordinarily, the labor that you would expect to see in January is feasting uh, because it's Christmas time. Uh, mm -hmm. Christmas uh, Christmas time being seen as going from the 25th of December to candle mass in February. So January is like when you get your party in time. Um, so, but this is probably kind of like a reference to the new year as a result. Um, in February, we have a lady uh, by the fireside with a cat. Uh, that is what I would expect to see in February. Uh, February, a lot of times you just see people next to the fire because it's cold. Uh, so, you know, like there's certain things that need to happen, but not tons. Uh, March, we see the traditional labor here of um, kind of pruning vines. So that's really kind of common. You need to you start putting them back. That's fine. Um, and in April, what you're seeing here is uh, so April and May, it's interchangeable. Um, and you, we are seeing either hawking, which is one of the laborers of the months, or kind of like uh, fun gardening. So like that's April, May, a lot of time it's kind of given over to the nobility and that's what's going on. So yeah, it's a bit of hawking. And then in June, we are seeing uh, getting the scythes ready to bring in the harvest or indeed uh, sheep shearing. Uh, so those are some of the labors of the month there. Um, and I would say given uh, the way that this looks, uh, this looks to me like it is from the arts and crafts period, uh, which I love. Um, so they're doing medievalisms, uh, so which, uh, which me too. I love that about them. Uh, and I, you can tell from the way that um, February is dressed here. So this is kind of like a really sort of like a, 
uh, the, the kind of dress that we would expect to see kind of more in the modern period. Um, and, but it's kind of got, got these uh, medieval aspects to it. So like the shawls and things. The rest of the months, however, are looking a little bit more medieval, but uh, so it's probably arts and crafts, but I love it. It's gorgeous. Okay. We're really beautiful in the modern period, fascinated with what went on with the medieval period still. Oh yeah. So like, this is the thing. Victorians love the medieval period. Oh my God. Victorians are obsessed with the medieval period, which is why a lot of the times people get confused and they'll be like, oh yeah, chivalry. And it's like the way we think about chivalry is actually Victorian. It's not, you know, as I say, um, and, and that's how you get a lot of things like, so, you know, the neo-Gothic building movement. So like a lot of churches will be kind of like fake medieval looking, um you see a lot of things like this and th there's a couple of reasons for it um oh so you know like any of the pre-raphaelite paintings you see absolutely tons of pre-raphaelite paintings that are on like uh, medieval subjects um love them but i'm like perfect great job everybody no notes uh but uh they they really like medieval period like as a result of uh, rapid industrialization that they're undergoing Okay. right so uh they kind of see the medieval period as it's like that's what they're doing their like return with a v about is is like the medieval period and they're kind of like oh the medieval period is a more wholesome time it's more religious in nature it's more spiritual like this is what we should all like be having our society more like uh because here we are simply like living in a fog of like you know coal dust and everybody works in a factory and it, it's not very aesthetic, right? So they were kind of like longing for a time when everyone was much more pastoral and like when they see everybody as being more uh, spiritual and things like that. But it's this kind of like specific modern longing for the past, right? That, they, that they're kind of engaged in. Um, so you see a lot of great medievalisms from around the time of the Victorians. And uh, frankly, I'm glad for that because I think it's cool and I like seeing neo-gothic things. So yes, that's good. <laughs> All right. So this was another one. And mm. I guess that's also from that same period. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely. So it definitely is. And we see the six, the first six months come across as the same thing. And then we get into July and we're starting the wheat harvest. Um, and then in August, you are threshing. Uh, which is, uh, you know, you would also expect to be seeing that. Um, in September, it's the grape harvest and making uh, wine. October, it's fattening pigs up um, or boars. Oftentimes, you'll see them being driven into the woods for the first time there. Um, in November here, we're seeing the planting of winter wheat um, or, you know, possibly some of the winter crops like, I don't know, veach or sorghum. Um, and then in December, it is the classic December one, which is uh, slaughtering pigs. So we would, that is what I bang on what I would expect to see for, for pretty much all these months. Yeah. Yeah. That's like, they, they did it right. So I'm curious a little bit about this. This seems to me to be a religious or a... Mm, yeah. Okay. Let's see what we got going on here. I'm going to, I'm just zooming in folks. Um, this looks like yeah, so this is, it seems, I'm cheating by reading. It looks like we have... Uh, I can't the, read Latin, so... <laughs> yeah, well, so there's, there's a first problem. So we've got the personifications of varying signs of the zodiac uh, is, is kind of what's going on here, but being connected to the months al along the outside. So again, you see January, do you see the, the two heads there? So it says January, well, Januarius, Februarius, uh, Marsus. So you're, you're seeing that around. So you're getting some labors of the months but with some kind of like added um, references to the uh, the varying sides of the zodiac that they are connected to. So those are kind of like around the outside. In the middle, um, you've got your boy God um, and he is holding the earth in one hand as we generally tend to see. And then I'm not sure what's kind of going on with this squiggle that he's got going in his other hand, but it might be an interesting kind of like whip or something um like get back to work or <laughs> yeah like i mean like i would expect it to be more like a, a like a, a ceremonial rod that kind of thing believe below that we've got um it looks like it's it's uh mary i think that says uh let says our lady on her and, then, and it's also it says god up at the top as well it says Dias in there uh but oh hold up hold up i'm zooming in more yeah, it's like supposed to be. Oh, that's Janus in the middle. So we're we're kind of doing some. 
we're doing some Romanness in the middle. So that's, uh, but they're like, quick, put God in there so everybody knows up the top. So that's God up the top. That also explains why I don't know what Janice is holding. Um, and so I think your little men up the top there, it's hard to kind of read this because of the light. Uh, but it looks like it might be Gog and Magog, which is something that you see a lot, but they're holding God up. So I don't really think that that is probably it. But based on what they're wearing, I'd make a guess. They might just be supposed to be some kind of like nebulous, uh, kind of like vaguely pagan people, which is why they're kind of like naked -y. Do you, Do you notice that they're, they're kind of draped in things? So yeah. they're, kind of, they're kind of trying to do like... Uh, they got some togas, they got some cloaks, everybody has bare feet yeah so basically i think that they're kind of it's an interesting one where it's kind of like a uh they're acknowledging the place within the christian universe but also kind of like making references to like older paganism which is interesting so uh okay. yeah uh but it's like i mean in the middle of that's janice the god of duality i guess like based on like what they've written but that's what i expect to see for january which is what is there so he's sitting there holding the sign so i'm kind of like really it's it's quite interesting this uh yeah yeah cool that's a really interesting one yeah i like this great great job everybody <laughs> all right so here's another one uh i think is a direct reference to serfs or a direct painting on serfs yeah i would think so so here we're seeing some uh they're bringing in the harvest so uh we see the three guys who are kind of bringing in the harvest and then we've got kind of like an overseer guy um and it looks like i think I, this is like a really quite a famous image uh this one and i think he's kind of like pointing out the thing that they're supposed to do next but those tools can also sometimes be used for flattening wheat so do you see that they're kind of like bunching it up but then you kind of like flatten it down so it can kind of be doing two things but it is kind of i think a reference you got the guys who are kind of on their knees and the one that's sort of directing things so it's about uh, probably the time of year when you do the most forced labor, which is harvest time. So we would kind of expect to this to be sort of like August. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I wanted to try and capture the full painting of this really mm. weird image. I think that this but is a bear dancing. I think that we. But unfortunately, uh, Music Have Medieval on YouTube has no link to what the painting is. So this is actually, um, I think it's a bear, but below there's animals, there's little babies nursing on it. Oh yeah, and, it could be, yeah. And so this guy is playing a drum, but he just doesn't look happy for some reason. And I was curious. Yeah, yeah, like what's his deal? Why is he unhappy about a dancing bear? Um, uh, <laughs> and like, it might just be, uh, like that it, this is kind of like artist's prerogative it might be that he's kind of like mad about it generally i think uh that this is i'm pretty sure that this comes from there's a series um in i've, I've googled it really quickly i didn't know it off the top of my head everybody but i was like which one is this uh but i'm pretty sure that it comes from uh bodleian library um ms uh 264 i'm pretty sure um, and it's probably showing us like a trained dancing bear. Um, and so he might be looking kind of scowly because he's like, look, well, like le less nurse and more dancing bear. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. All right. And that's the, that's the sort of thing that it's like, it's a really uh, it, fairly common, you know, to have kind of like trained bears as like a, you know, form of performance. Yeah. Okay. So it was normal for people. It, was it just bears were the popular animal? Um, yeah, bears are kind of like one of the big ones, like in order to train, like they, they are pretty trainable and tractable. Um, you know, they, they still exist. Uh, it's like a kind of like bears and monkeys were what the big ones for. Yeah. Think organ grinders, that kind of deal, but like okay. medieval and, uh, you know, it's, it's a form of exoticism essentially. Okay. All right, so this is when we start dwelling into the really weird stuff. Yeah, okay, so this is interesting because uh, it's clearly from a Jewish manuscript just based on the script below it. Um, and we've got a little uh, bunny that's wearing a cape that has a stick on a dog's head and then there's a pig coming in holding a cup. <laughs> um, which, huh, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know really what to go with this because sometimes people are just doodling animals because they think they're neat, right? Or they're just having fun with anthropomorphized animals because why not, right? Um, I would imagine 
that if we're like going around showing pigs with cups, it might be a reference in a Jewish manuscript to non-Jewish people, you know, what with um, our proclivity to eat pigs and things of that nature. So would um, that be an insult? It, it not necessarily. It might just be more like, uh, hey, not Jewish person. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but uh, like it, it, it could be. It, it's within the realm of possibility. Um, but, you know, like it could also just be like a grotesquerie, essentially, because, you know, uh, medieval people just like showing that right like they they just like to do kind of funny little doodles sometimes and it's uh, a lot of times people are looking for like uh oh is there a is there kind of like a meaning um to this and it's like eh, no it's we think it maybe was fun okay uh, so it would uh, be like reading the comic section of the newspaper yeah yeah kind of like that like where sometimes it's like yeah it is uh a hundred percent like uh that is like that like this is something that they mean something by and sometimes they just kind of dig it right like and we do a lot of research on it like why do we have a lot of like rabbits we're not quite sure yet why do we have a lot of knights like hunting snails we're not sure actually. okay because this so. was a <laughs> snail and knight was my next one i love and snail and knight yeah snail and knight uh, we so we don't know why um, there's so there's a couple competing theories about uh, knights and snails uh, fighting. One is that uh, we might be using snails as a personification for um, sloth, you mm -hmm. know, because they move. So it's kind of like fighting off sloth. That could be one. Um, it can be one where the, it's been suggested that perhaps the snails are kind of like um, I've I've seen it said like the snails is kind of like a symbol for the resurrection. And I'm like, oh, in this case, why are we fighting them? But you know, see the knight here, his. Uh, shield is kind of like a face so maybe they're indicating that he's a pagan i don't know but then also it might just be that people like drawn snails uh like uh, snails are the thing that i doodle uh you know when you're just doodling for no particular reason and i can't tell you why i just think that i like making the shell or something so we're okay. not exactly sure but we've got some theories is the point okay now when you say sloth uh that's an interesting word oh, yeah. is that like a keyword like for yeah yeah sorry describing someone or were there actual sloths that were a problem back then no okay so sloth is one of the seven deadly sins so okay. uh it's they are um uh, let's see gluttony pride wrath sloth um vanity uh lust and envy there you go um, so, uh, it, it's like, it's not considered good to be lazy, essentially. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. snails being slow, it's like, maybe they're just lazy. Like that, that's one of, one of the ones we think. <laughs> lazy night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So then I have this other one since we're on the topic of rabbits. <laughs> yeah. The bunnies like, yeah. So bunnies come up a lot. We're not really necessarily sure why bunnies uh, but bunnies come up a lot, um, and and there there's some competing ideas on this, like bunnies as, as symbols of fertility. Bunnies sometimes are just kind of like it's just like topsy turvy because sometimes it'll be like a bunny is like shooting at a dog or something like that. This looks like bunnies are maybe in school, and you've got kind of like headmaster bunny that is like holding up the switch, and they've got because they've got like a little stylus and are sort of writing, and there's like three little bunnies and a big bunny. So I'm gonna go with this is bunny school uh and that is cute and nice uh so i think it's just kind of like funny <laughs> like okay for that. this is comical all right i didn't know if back then like there was a certain mythology around rabbits because i know yeah. that hairs are associated with um beltane yeah yeah um uh like we don't again we don't really know like uh exactly why like so there's there's various things like sometimes they are symbols of helplessness sometimes they are symbols of like purity um sometimes so like you, you kind of like see them come up um in the background of things like uh like durer has them uh in like the background of scenes with the holy family to kind of like show their purity right so it's like rabbits kind of like make sense there um, but we often see them like doing kind of, uh, human things like hunting or things like that. But within that, it's usually kind of like joking about, um, the, when you see kind of like rabbits that are doing human things, it's often kind of like making a joke. We think at, uh, the rigid kind of way that society 
is run. So, you know, like a killer rabbit kind of like going after a dog, it's like, oh, ho, ho, the world's gone crazy. Everything's sort of like upside down, right? So, ah, yeah, which you've got in the next one, which is, this is a classic, absolute classic. So you've got um, everything where you've got a dog who is riding a rabbit, jousting a rabbit who is riding a snail and the snail has the head of an old man. Um, and this is probably just funny. Like, you know, it's probably just like anything to do. Also, I like it because the rabbit is like shocked. He's like shocked. <laughs> yeah. So. The dog, the dog's the only person happy in this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, the dog, the dog's having a great time. The rabbit does not like being ridden, and the snail old man is looking not very, very happy. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it's like, I, it's so kind of here, like the thing that's, you know, part of what's funny here too is that it's like, you know, because uh, you know, bunny rabbits are prey animals, right? They're like the least threatening thing that you can think of, so it's kind of like funny to give them a spear, right? <laughs> yes. Now there's this one. I'm kind of curious because there's a series of like murder rabbit paintings. Yeah, there are a series of murder rabbit paintings. Um, but this and, woman looks like she's about to be taken advantage of by two rabbits. Um, yeah, is that a woman? I'm like, yeah, it might be. Yeah, it's a, so these ones, uh, this one comes from a really famous, I think this is from the, uh, these are from the uh, British Library MS Royal 10, I think, 10E. Um, and yeah, you have a bunch of rabbits in this one and they do a bunch of like wild things. So, uh, they are like, uh, they hang a guy, um, they like, they're decapitating people. Um, they kind of like, they hunt a guy, um, and kind of like drag him back, like using other bunnies as though they were horses. Um, and I think this might be the guy. Yeah. So here that he's being skinned. So see, that's, do you see? Oh, he's got the knife. Yeah. Yeah, do you see the thing down on the foot? And then you kind of see a foot under the foot. So it's like they're, they're skinning. Okay. So so it's it's an an inversion of what a rabbit would do to, uh, what a human would do to a rabbit, right? That's Uh what the, and you see uh, the one with the stick over the head. So it's about to give her a big whack in the head to kill it. Okay. (laughs) Like, you know, like to finish her off. All right. So was this like uh, back then was, was this just like sick humor or? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, a lot of this is probably just um, like, it, it's just for comic, you know, effect. we think. Okay. Um, so we, we, it doesn't really necessarily have a whole lot of meaning beyond lol that like, this is quite funny. We don't think. Um, and it's, but it's, it's funny because of how upside down the world has to be for this to be true. Okay, so th- this is also uh, like a time capsule as to how violent the times were back then. Well, yeah, well, you, you know, here's one thing that's going on is that, uh, you know, medieval people kill their own food as a general rule of thumb. And so it's like, here we go. We've got these rabbits on this one. Uh, and we've got some dogs who are attacking rabbits and the rabbits are defending in the tower. Like, so they're doing, they're sieging a castle. So it's cute. It's like a, like a little idea about warfare. Um, and so here, you know, the, the joke is like the anthropomorphize, anthropomorphization of these animals. But um, also here, what it's kind of talking about is the process of hunting rabbits. So, you know, like just sending dogs on rabbits, right? So it's kind of like in the real world, when you hunt a rabbit, you go send your dog after it, your dog goes, picks it up and kills it. You bring it back, you, you know, and, and whatever else. But this is like, oh, but if dogs and rabbits were like humans, then because the, the rabbits would be on the defense because the dogs are the ones trying to attack them, then they're going to be in the tower. So it's kind of like a, talking about hunting, essentially. Okay. This is also depicting about, you know, the violence of people catching yeah. the meat. I mean, yeah, like, uh, you know, for them that like, you know, like killing animals, that's daily life, right? You're like, mm. yeah, yeah, it's normal. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep all right so speaking of death i don't know if this is actually a medieval this looks like a, this is early modern but it's still good and it, it's based on a medieval trope which is called the dance macabre um we start it seeing, is october it is october <laughs> and i mean we simply love to talk about it so the dance macabre um is an art trope that we see kind of come up uh in the late middle ages um, so it's, it kind of like comes out in the 15th century. 
Um, and it is a form of what we call memento mori or like a, a way of remembering that you're going to die or reminding you of the fact that you're going to die. Um, and so as a result, you should focus on heaven. So here we're seeing a bunch of well-dressed women in particular dancing with skeletons. And uh, so we can see a couple of them are queens. Uh, so they've got crowns on their heads, but they're, they're all kind of like well-to-do in general. And that is oftentimes uh, a, a really common theme because what they're kind of saying is that you shouldn't be too caught up in worldly vanity. Don't care about the way that you look. Don't care about having nice clothes because you're going to end up dead anyway, right? So instead of worrying about the way that you're dressed and worrying about your looks, you should be getting right with God because at any moment you may die. Um, so it starts out as a medieval thing um, in the medieval period, but it goes well, I think, into like the 16th century at the very least. So um, yeah, like it comes up, it comes up. Okay. And it, it's a cool one. I like them. All right. Now, my next question is, was there actually like a dance macabre, like a dance that people did? And were there music to to accompany it? Oof. Um, that's a difficult one to say. When we see dance macabres in these things, a lot of the time, the instruments that they'll be accompanied with are like hurdy-gurdies or um, bagpipes. Uh which are common late medieval instruments. Um, and we often see them also depicted in things in hell, which I think is kind of like a, a you know, a joke about the way people feel, feel about bagpipes and that kind of thing. Um, probably not. I mean, there's always dancing and dancing oftentimes like it comes as like a form of a reel. Um, and you might get it on, you know, All Souls Day and things like that. But, you know, music that like, we associate with this time of year is like more often like, you know, funerary chanting. So like, you know, D.A. Syri, which is like, a, or the Day of Wrath is a specific kind of like Latin chant that was made for like saying on Halloween. So it's <laughs> like, you know, you know, the medieval versions are a little bit more like, no, God hates you for sure. But like, <laughs> <laughs> just a reminder that God hates you. Yeah. Yeah. Knock that off. Knock it off. <laughs> All right. Here's another thing. I think the skeletons personally are like my favorite. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So, yeah. Ooh, what do we got here? So this looks like, uh, it looks like this is an army of the dead. And we've got kind of like uh, the, they, they are kind of like drumming. You've got a skeleton in the foreground drumming. You've got some uh, guys on long trumpets. And I think that probably what we are seeing here, oh, one's got a hurdy-gurdy, you see. Do you see like behind the, this guy in front? So there's always a hurdy-gurdy, right? Um, and I think probably what you're seeing is them marshalling up the army of the dead um, at the end of the world. So this is this would probably be what we would call a triumph of death. So um, again, focusing on the fact that eventually everybody dies and you need to kind of like get right with God, uh, but they like to do spooky things about it. Uh, and, you know, it, it's also kind of like a reference to the apocalypse. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is a great one. Yeah, again, this is a this is a dance macabre. But my man here's got a clarinet. I love yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what you see here is also interesting because you're seeing um, bodies at different uh, points in decomposition. Um, so you know you've got two people, well, two skeletons that are essentially just skeletons, but then you have others that have kind of like tatted open skin and like you know intestines coming out, um, hair kind of molding off. Um, and so this is this is the same thing, kind of reminder of uh, your inevitable death. So they, they'll do it sometimes just with all skeletons. Uh, but a, an interesting thing that we see from stuff like this is, um, you know, in addition to being more comfortable, like with killing animals and stuff like that, medieval people um, are also around uh, dead bodies a lot more than we are. Um, so, you know, when all of your dead people kind of get buried in one churchyard, a thing about this is that they get what we called oversubscribed. And so like you will, every time you need to kind of like dig a new grave for someone who's died, you will end up kind of disturb disturbing other graves. And like eventually sometimes also um, bones will sort of come out of the ground and, and things like that. So at which point in time, these bodies are often like, you know, bones and things like this will then be picked up and taken to what is called a charnel house um, or a charnel pit, where it's like when you don't know whose skull that is or whatever, but you know, they still deserve some dignity and to be kind of like in hallowed ground, these things will be removed. So medieval people are often around, you know, 
bodies in in various forms of uh, decomposition much more so than we are and so this this particular dance macabre is also kind of like reflecting like it, it shows us that right it shows us the fact that they are they know more about medieval death than we do well well about death in general obviously medieval death they know way more about it than me baby but like you know death in general yeah <laughs> okay i'm curious about like why all the skeletons always smile uh yeah well it's like uh oh, so this is this is fantastic i actually have part of this on my wall um so this is again uh, this is called the triumph of death um it's it's a really good one um and you are seeing here, this is more specifically an apocalyptic vision because you're seeing the four horse, horsemen in various places. So you see famine, uh, you see death, you see war, um, you, you see plague. Um, and so the skeletons are usually smiling because well, in the first place they have to, right? It's like, there's, there's just all two there. Right? So that's what it looks like. <laughs> Um, but it's also kind of like, uh, you know, like the dance macabre and things like that with like the, the, the kind of like gusto that they have is just sort of like, um, they're sort of supposed to be like laughing at the foolishness of the living who aren't living their lives correctly. Okay. So it's sort of like taking glee in the fact that people are doing the wrong thing. Now this one. Oh God, I love this one. Um, it, it's so you kind of like see, I think one of my favorite bits here is you see there's all these people who are kind of like running away from uh, that's that's got the sigh here and they're all kind of like running into what looks like a building, but it's actually a trap. And there's like another skeleton that's kind of like holding, yeah, up the top yeah. of that. I'm that it's like holding the door open and they're all going to get trapped in there anyway. So this is kind of like specifically talking about the futility of fleeing from death. There's absolutely nothing you can do. You see this one uh, royal, per like kind of noble person by this game of cards down the bottom where everyone else is kind of like just getting grabbed by skeletons and dying and he's like oh i'm gonna draw my sword and fight like up it. death is serving a plate of skull but, yeah you like that right because because they're all, they're sitting there eating nice things and it's like oh yeah well how about death right so i, I so i love the guy that's drawing his sword like i'm gonna fight death like I'm okay fight death. yeah good i also luck. like how if you look over there's like a dog I don't know yeah. if he's like trying to rescue a baby or eat a dead body. Yeah, it's like, it's really, really, it, it's, I mean, this is just such a classic one because it's got so many little bits. Like every time I look at this painting, I see something new, uh, but yeah. I, I absolutely love this one. Um, and I but like yeah, the orchestra while the guy is getting tortured. Yeah, that and was fantastic. The skeleton, I don't know why the skeleton stealing all the king's gold yeah it's it's so it's again like a, you know it's a reminder of like it doesn't matter if you're rich like oh you're rich aren't you you're gonna die right <laughs> like so it's just kind of like like oh you're fancy and you're playing cards and having a nice time you're gonna die like it, it just doesn't matter and so it's kind of like it's just you know reiterating that all these worldly things pass and like you can't it basically it's saying you can't take it with you okay but but in an aggressive way it's like it's like the opposite of yolo opposite. Like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Now, speaking of worldly things, there's some like really weird profane art as well. Yeah. Okay. So here, these are interesting because these are two of the quote unquote monstrous races. Um, so there are oftentimes when they write about the rest of the world, uh, medieval Europeans will be all like, oh yeah. And in Africa, they are, there are the skiopods, which is who we see here on the left. So they're people with one giant foot um, and they are said to lay on their backs and use their one giant foot to shade themselves from the sun. Um, and then uh, we also have over on the right, oh my God, why is their name escaping me now? The monsters that have their, uh, I've got a Google monstrous race. Um, uh, the, the ones that have their, oh, no, I remember it anyway, blemier, a blemier. Um, so there's also considered to be these um, humans that like, instead of having a head on their shoulders or whatever, they have like a, their head in their chest. Uh, there's also monstrous races, like it's considered that there's like a, a bunch of dog headed people that live somewhere and, and this sort the of thing. The Silas Epinelli, is that it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly it. Yeah. So here so here we have got a Blemier who is shooting an arrow into the butt of a skiopod. Um, and it's probably kind of like making a joke about how if you do lay on your back and use your foot, like your bum will be in there. And they love fart jokes. They love bum jokes. Like, you know, they, they, they have a real, real kind of like fifth grade uh, form of humor to the medieval people. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. 
All right. And now I might have to censor this for YouTube, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's the nuns and the penis tree. Um, yeah. So this is uh, this comes to us from a copy of the Roman de la Rose, which is held by the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in uh, France. Um, and so it's a it's series. So you see one uh, one nun harvesting penises from a tree in another one you see two nuns harvesting penises from a tree in another one you see a nun leading a monk along by his penis uh, which she's got like a leash around and then they have sex in a haystack um so this is kind of doing a number of things uh penis trees are a recurring motif um in medieval art um and they do a couple of things we think in the first place they're a reference to fertility more generally uh but it's also like um a kind of reference to women's insatiable interest in sex um and sexuality so you know the idea that if a woman could she would like harvest all these penises right because women women love to shag essentially um and so you see it come up all the time um in medieval art uh, the, the, this kind of like collecting of penises thing um it's funny here because it's a nun and she's not supposed to be doing it right so it's also kind of like a subtle jab at the clergy and the fact that a lot of clergy do have sex even though they're not supposed to kind of like it does it does what you think is the thing is that a lot of the time these are references to people who are particularly interested in sex or people who are kind of like being carried away by sex um you know like a, being carried away by one's own lust and like into sin is sort of a thing um you see a lot of um in the late medieval period in the lowlands you see a lot of pilgrims badges which will be like uh anthropomorphized penises or um anthropomorphized vulvae and things like that and those we kind of think uh, are doing a few things we think in the one, first place they're funny in the second place uh kind of like uh being on pilgrimage is sort of like being on spring break so it's kind of like advertising that you're sort of up for it and like you you would have some sex uh but it also might be that it's like uh you know fertility related things so maybe you're on pilgrimage for fertility reasons so you know there's there's a lot of things in there but um part of it is also we just think that they think it's funny <laughs> The era of fifth grade humor. <laughs> yeah, that's right, baby. So, okay, all right. <clears throat> so, um, I, I think I'm going to be on my last two questions now. All right. First one being, uh, what is the legacy of this era? Oh, I mean, there's so many of them, <laughs> isn't there? That, that's a that's a quite interesting one. Um, I think that we've got a great legacy in terms of. Um, we still like a lot of their literature, right? So we still like a lot of like Arthuriana and like Camelot stories. And, you know, like the great kind of chivalric romances, things like that, we still kind of carry with us. Um, and these ideas of kind of like knights and ladies doing great things. Like that's something that we still really love. And, and we're, we're keeping that alive. You know, it's not just uh, the Victorians who like that. We like that, right? You know, like there's all sorts of medieval like what we call medievalisms today so you know like doing things kind of like in a, a, a medieval style so i think that that's you know testament to how good they were at like making interesting stories that we like to read and, and you know we still do read medieval things so that's cool so i i would definitely say that that is one thing um i would say also um one of the things that we kind of do a lot of the time that's quite medieval is we're still kind of like mm, trying to come up with it because there, there, there's like a lot of different things i've got I, I suppose that sometimes a lot of the ways that we talk about um relationships uh between like sometimes when i'm like watching like people from the manosphere and stuff like that the way they talk about women is like very medieval and i don't mean like the oh like get them back in the kitchen stuff it's like you know when you see the image of the the nun collecting penises it's the same thing as you see like with like right-wing people like being very upset that like women have a lot of sexual partners that they meet on tinder it's like the same kind of complaint 
you know, is this idea that it's like, oh, for women, it's just like an unlimited like penis smorgasbord. And like, so you see a lot of kind of like hand wringing about that still. And every time I see it, it always makes me laugh because it's like, you know, I'm thinking of the the nuns in the penis tree and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, like what's new? <laughs> like, there's like, so some guy's gonna be mad about it. So like, that's still kind of like really hanging out. So, you know, we could take the two things. We can have like a, on the one hand, like a, not treating women too well, but on the other hand, pretty good stories. So, you know, we got those, we got, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> okay. All right. And so if you could like a message for future generations. Mm. That's a great question. So I suppose the thing that I, you know, one of the things I worry about genuinely, like in terms of a message for future generations is, will it get to them? Because, you know, one of the big myths about the medieval period is that, you know, the idea of the dark ages, that they were all stupid and they didn't know anything. And it's just like about survival of sources and how it doesn't, it doesn't really make it all the way all the time. And the thing I worry about is that like all this media, all these things that we make, all of it's, you know, digital now. And is it going to get to future generations, you know, like, will, will it get there? So I guess that one of the things that I really hope for the future and I hope for, for future generations is that people will uh, pay attention to like trying to keep sources, even if they, it seems very silly, you know, like, like trying to keep a backlog of things so that, you know, future historians can go in and have a look at it because we won't ever really know about a society if we can't like dig through their stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Eleanor. Thanks so much for having me.